So, okay, um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's educational webinar, proudly hosted by the International Trade Council. My name is Anne, and I'm thrilled to be your host for today. So before we get started, let's make sure our technical setup is working perfectly. Please type yes in the chat box if you can hear my voice clearly, and please, um, if the presentation or Mr. Sebrightchen presentation on your screen. Well, take a brief moment for us to confirm everything. Okay, um, thank you for confirming everyone. So, we have a fantastic session today focused on navigating cross-border investment in a complex world. So, this webinar will cover key topics including the strategic insight into cross-border investment, navigating regulatory and cultural challenges, effective risk management techniques, and also leveraging joint ventures and alliances. We are honored to have Mr. Sebrightchen, founder, chairman, and CEO at Summer Atlantic Capital as our distinguished speaker today. So Sebright also brings a wealth of experience and insights that we are all eager to learn from. Without further ado, I'll pass the virtual stage um, to you, Mr. Sebright. All right. Thank you, lady. And... Uh... Uh, thank you for the introduction and thanks everyone for joining me from you know all over the world and different time zones for you know spending the time with me so i'll start sharing my screen right now so can anyone hear me well and see my screen So if yes, I'll start our topic today. So um, our topic today is going to be focusing on the cross-border investment in today's global economy. Um, so first, uh, before we start, let me just uh, give a very brief introduction about uh, who we are and what we are doing. So I'm the founder of Summer Energy Capital. So we are an international asset management hub that focusing on technology and healthcare sectors from the North America region, as well as the European region to help companies expand internationally to different markets. So what we do is for companies we partner with in those sectors from those different territories, we help them with a few different aspects, such as strategic capital they need in order to be su become successful in their international expansion stage, as well as we help them with regulatory approvals, clinical trials, and business development in the new markets as well. So sometimes we go even deeper and form joint ventures with our partners in the international markets and become their operating partners. So in summary, we got three different roles. We are investors, we are joint venture partners and operating partners for them, as well as market expansion advisors for them. So a very brief introduction of myself. Um, so uh, before I founded Summer Atlantic, I was a CFO of an artificial intelligence startup that was acquired by one of the largest technology companies in the world back in 2018. And uh, I'm also the chairman for the Venture Capital Council here at the International Trade Council, as well as serving as a leadership council member at National Small Business Association in the US. So I received my MBA from the University of Chicago Bull School of Business and uh, received many other awards in the past few years uh, as you know, like one of the best CEOs in the investment management world globally. And our company was luckily receiving many awards in the past few years, thanks for you know, those media companies and award agencies recognition to our efforts in the past few years. So not wasting too much time on you know, like uh, introduction of ourselves, I'll go to the topic directly. So before we start, I wanted to just introduce quickly about uh, what we will cover today. So we will separate into five different sections. The first section will be discussing and exploring the landscape of the global markets currently. And then we will go to the strategic approaches to cross-border investment. 
After that, we'll be dis discussing and brainstorming how we are going to best mitigating and managing the risks in cross-border investment. Afterwards, we will start discussing how we can leverage the joint ventures and strategic alliances to achieve our goals, international expansion and growth. And then we will have a recap and open for questions and answers to, for discussion. So before we go to the main topic, what will be the benefits for us to discuss today's topic? So what, 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 what's it for us to discuss to our conduct cross-border investments in today's global economy, especially after the pandemic and uh, the current volatility and the geopolitical situations in different economies? So a few different things I think it's important to mention as I listed here. The first thing is one of the most important benefits and the most obvious benefits for all of us to understand is a market expansion. Access to new markets will bring new market opportunities, increase market shares, and allow companies to enter new markets and ex expanding their customer bases and revenue streams. This part is especially important to industries where domestic markets are saturated or growing slowly. And the second point I wanted to bring up here is going to bring us diversifications. The diversifications from two different aspects. The first aspect is going to be the revenue stream diversifications. Cross-border investments provide access to new sources of revenue, which can be crucial during economic downturns in local markets, especially under the current situation, as well as it will bring us geographic diversifications. For example, investing in multiple countries reduces our reliance on single market and spreading the risk across different economic contexts. This can provide, uh, protect us from local downturns on market specific risk as well. So, Besides diversification and uh, market share expansion, what else we can get from the cross-border investment? We'll be able to access to localized investors, resources, and talent. For example, we will be able to access some skilled labors and innovation in some mature markets, and we can access specific natural resources in certain markets such as Middle East in, you know, for oil and gas industry and agricultural products in other markets as well, which we cannot find in our local markets. This also brings us cost efficiency and supply chain effectiveness. For example, uh, lots of US companies and European companies that are reaching the Asian market, such as, you know, before it used to be China, and right now there are some cost, uh, you know, increasement in China in terms of the labor and manufacturing. So some of those company, international companies that move their manufacturing headquarter to emerging markets such as Southeast Asia to leveraging this cost efficiency as well. So of course, lower production cost company can benefit from lower labor and production cost in certain countries, improving profitability and allowing for more competitive pricing. So lower cost, not just in the labor and production, but also the tax part as well. Some countries offer favorable tax, tax rates to attract foreign investments, such as Singapore and Hong Kong, which, you know, it's a very favorable market as comparing to uh, certain U.S and China, you know, those countries like that in terms of tax. Um, and this will also bring us economic growth for the, in terms of GDP for different countries we are having exporters with, which I'm not going to spend too much time discussing this, but also create resilience to global economic shifts. So we will go to the first section today, understanding the landscape. The first thing is going to be the global investment trends. So in terms of the global investment trends, I listed a few different points here, emerging market focus, technology innovation, sustainable ESG, things like that. So uh, for emerging, for the first point I listed here, emerging markets focus, I wanted to point out that uh, emerging market is not a new topic. Investors are always keeping an eye on emerging markets, but the concept of emerging markets are consistently evolving. For example, 
companies like China used to be emerging markets, but not really considering as 100% emerging markets at this moment. So, as, so considering of this situation, investors are increasingly targeting emerging market due to their high growth potential. So some of the Southeast Asian countries become the next target. But there is some there are some risks associated with that as well, which we will mention that in later stage during our discussion today, due to you know like expansion always involve risk as well. So for sustainability and ESG are becoming integral to investment decisions due to lots of governments started to integrating ESG criteria and sustainability criteria in their overall compliance management policies, which means most of the large corporations and mid-sized companies started to penetrating those concepts and policies into part of their corporate governance to be compliant with the government requirements. And uh, reconsidering private equity and venture capital manager selection criteria, this is something very interesting for us to mention because uh, for most of the investors, they used to follow the big names and uh, previous track of, rec track of records rather than the actual people and the, and the deals they are currently doing, which, <coughs> which are not really making lots of sense currently. So shall we following the big names or go with the right people? Right now, in the recent years, considering of the returns of previous private active fund managers, more and more limited partners started to think about we should follow the teams, follow the people, and follow what they are building rather than the big names themselves. So for geopolitical situations, geopolitical tensions and trade policies in recent years are influencing cross-border investments. Investors are becoming more cautious and strategic about navigating risk associated with international trade conflicts and regulatory changes. In other words, for certain categories and certain geographical locations, some institutional investors used to invest very aggressively and they started to change to a more localized strategy to find a good local partner before they can do anything due to the current geopolitical situation to avoid one of the system risk. And I will skip the diversification strategies that go to the enhanced um, AML requirements, regulatory and compliance considerations. So AML are becoming more and more important in different countries globally due to the recent local re local recessions in certain countries as well as the south of that case as we all know and uh, the related corrupt in the banking community in certain countries so what we learned from the south of bank case and what about its implications for the banking and investment communities globally the real issue of south bank is quite complicated but if we want to simplify it and uh, mention a very key point of that is anti-money laundering issue. It's also related to the recent case of Credit Suisse as well. So both SoftBank and Credit Suisse encounter some issues with their source of capital, which if we further track down, uh, we dig into their source of capital. We figure there are many political driven money as well as uh, the KYC didn't complete it very carefully due to the requir AML requirements, and thus bring significant corruption issues for their investment. So due to this situation, more and more players and, regulated, uh, and regulators globally started to execute more strict AML requirements and leverage new fintech financial technology tools to help monitor this process globally. So in the future, the AML requirements as well as technology related to that will be a critical part of the integrated cross-border inv cross investment. So let's go to the next slide and take a look of the current global investment trends from the data side. Global FDI flows dropped 7% 7 7 in 2022, continuing a downward trend and failing to reach pre-pandemic levels for the second year in a row. But if we take a look at the overall data globally, it still 
growing on a very slow pace, which is on its normal stage, which does not show, at least from the FDA data, it didn't really show a indica uh, as an indicator for a potential global recession. It still shows us a stable economy on worse globally, but we'll have some volatilities in the short term. And we'll have some volatilities in the long term in certain countries and areas such as China. So if we take a look at those two graphs over here, on the left hand, it's uh, for the direct investment inflows. And on the right hand side is the foreign direct inv investment outflows. We can find out that US and China are two of the countries in the world that have uh, the most in both uh, FDI inflows and FDI outflows. And in terms of the industries that are driving the most FDI, there are four different parts and trends we summarized. The first thing is the transformation of industry 4.0, which is now something new. But uh, this part is consistently going till we reach this milestone. Deglobalization, localization, and the supply chain restructuring will play, uh, will play a very critical role in the next 10 years due to the current geopolitical situation. Lots of global companies used to have manufacturing outsourced in emerging markets and supply for uh, markets globally. Now, due to the policy restrictions, may need to relocate some of their manufacturing R&D centers in different countries and supply locally to fit and match the new regulatory requirements. Decarbonization and ESG as what I just introduced. Since central governments globally are in implementing the policies from the policy perspective and regulators perspective, more and more large corporations globally, as well as state owned enterprises in China, have to adapt to this situation to be compliant with this in order to avoid possible punishment. And recession in regional economies is something we observe is not avoidable, it's unavoidable, and will bring some volatilities in both short and long term. And if we take a look at the key regions that are attracting cross-border investment, US is still the number one uh, from the total net inflows and current GDP. The next one is China, and the third one is Singapore, and the fourth one is Hong Kong, and the next one is France. So we can, from this, we can observe ch uh, Chinese market as well as um, US, are most active markets in foreign direct investments. So let's take a look at the key sectors attracting cross-border investment. Like what we mentioned, TMT is still one of the most popular sector, but part of TMT, information technology, are more popular than the rest of the other sectors. Information technology, healthcare and biotech, renewable energy and sustainability, other top four, uh, other top three go to sectors for global investors. And if we dig into this regional focus, we'll figure that there are some adaptations in different countries toward those sectors and selections as well. For example, in the US, the US attracted significant FDI in technology, pharmaceutical, and real estate industry investment. And like the US, China continues to draw FDI in manufacturing, technology, and clean energy, such as renewable energy and green sustainability related stuff. For Europe, they are particularly strong in renewable energy financial services like FinTech, as well as advanced manufacturing. India, which is also a very significant, significant market in terms of population market size, it's notable for its growing technology sector, healthcare, and infrastructure investments. Now we move to the regulatory landscape in the global market. So what are the important aspects we should be aware of in terms of regulatory landscape? The first thing I will say is going to be the national security and foreign investment laws, which are kind of like a mandatory laws, can be a deal breaker for some of us. For example, these laws often apply to sectors very critical, such as defense, telecommunications, energy, and technology sector in broad. 
for example, in the U.S., the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. reviews foreign investment for national security implications, and some mergers and acquisitions can be stopped by the CFIS. In Europe, the EU has a framework for screening foreign direct investment to protect criminal infrastructure and technologies as well. Similar to US and Europe, in China, the national security law and foreign investment law outline specific requirements and restrictions on foreign investment. If we dig into the specific sectors, there are some relevant laws in each sector as well. For example, in the financial services sector, many countries have strict regulations on the percentage of foreign ownership in sectors such as banks, insurance companies, and financial institutions. In the telecommunications sector, many regions, foreign investment in telecommunication is subject to approval at certain levels. So I will skip the investment screening and approval process and go to the currency controls and repa re repatriation of profits. So currency controls, some emerging markets such as China impose controls on the foreign exchange to manage the flow of foreign capital and prevent capital flight. This can be a very critical issue for an foreign enterprise if, uh, to enter this market because once they decided to invest in this market, they have to prepare to file relevant regulatory applications before they can smoothly drag their capital outside of this market. So that's why we will discuss this a little bit later in our discussion today as well. Exchange rate policies fixed on managed exchange uh, rates can impact the profitability and risk of cross-border investments as well. So we can take a look at the compliance and legal diligence in cross-border investment and how we are going to mitigate that. In order to mitigate the legal and reg regulatory risk, we first need to understand the local laws. So we need to hire a very good local legal counsel and attorney to work together with our local attorney and compliance team to help us get through the local law and the regulatory approvals, which is our first, one of the first thing to do in entering a new market. And the next thing is going to be protection against the fraud and the corruption, such as anti-corruption compliance and adherence to anti-money laundering laws. So, which means we have to conduct very strict due diligence to ensure the investment is now being used as a vehicle for money laundering or financing illegal activities which could lead to severe legal and reputational damage. And the third thing is going to be the assessment of financial viability and risk management, which also leads us back to one part of the due diligence is going to be the financial due diligence part. By assessing the financial health of the target company or asset, investor can make informed decisions this includes evaluating financial statements, tax compliance, things like that, and liabilities related to the investment. And if we are conducting an M&A transaction, mergers and acquisitions transaction, in order to enter a new market, we also need to understand relevant law protections in the new market. Because, for example, U.S. is a very mature market. If we do a M&A, it's very straightforward. But for certain Asian countries, once we do an MIA, we need to understand what's behind the current legal structure in the local market and the risks associated with that, such as liabilities, tax, and uh, you know, like the sensitivity of the previous company. And then next, we need to ensure contractual and corporate governance compliance and facilitate smooth transaction process. One important thing to mention is the protection of intellectual property and other assets when entering a new market. The first thing is going to be very important is the IP rights. In many cases, intellectual property is a significant part of the investment. So our due diligence in the legal part ensures IP rights are properly protected. So that will lead to our next topic as well. I will spend more time later in our presentation to explain how we are going to do this. 
And then the reputation risk management is also important to prevent possible scandals. Let's go to the next section to discuss the strategic approaches to cross-border investments. So first thing first, we need to take a look at the market entry structures and strategies. There are some structures we usually use, such as exporting, which are very normal. We do not have to set up any new entities in entering the new market. And licensing, franchising, joint ventures, strategic alliance partnerships, and piggy banking. There are also some other ways, like what I listed here, wholly owned subsidiaries, mergers and acquisitions, greenfield investment, turnkey projects, contract manufacturing and outsourcing, which I'm not going to expand too many details here to not spending too much time. So exporting, it's like an international trade without setting up a new entity. The advantage is very obvious, no, very low capital investment required, minimal risk and exposure to the foreign markets. And then we will have the flexibility to exit the market easily if we need. But the disadvantage is very obvious as well. First, it, we will have very limited control over marketing and distribution in the new markets. And the tariffs, custom duties, and logistics can increase possible costs associated with that as well. And the currency fluctuation will bring us lots of risk under this situation as well. The next thing is going to be licensing, which are widely used by certain technology companies and the pharmaceutical companies. So advantage with licensing is, of course, low risk and investment. You do not have to, usually you do not have to invest too much money because usually the license, licensor will pay you. And it brings you access to local market knowledge and distribution networks. And it also, it is also a quick market entry. The disadvantage for licensing structure include limited control over production quality and brand image as well as potential for creating a future competitor and difficult to enforce intellectual property rights. So in the long term, if you are very confident about your assets and your operational capabilities, it's better for you to enter the new market in a joint venture or strategic alliance rather than licensing structure. Franchising is very obvious as well, uh, we, which we will skip that part and go to the joint venture and strategic alliance. So joint venture sometimes is considered as a subcategory as part of the strategic alliance and partnerships. So for joint ventures, it's an equity partnership, equity partnership between two companies or more to form a new company in the new market, in the, in the new market to sharing ownership, control, and profits. The advantage of a joint venture in the new market include access to local market knowledge, network, and resources, share risk and investment with a local partner, as well as either compliance with regulations, local regulations, and policies. The disadvantage for joint ventures include potential for conflicts, for you know, like the shareholders uh, in the companies and partners over control and profit sharing and strategic decisions as well, as well as loss of full control over operations and decision making and cultural and organizational difference could lead to misunderstandings and some conflicts as well, which you know, conflicts management is going to be a very important thing. And then let's take a look at analyzing the market and how we're going to do is analyze the market and the potential risk. So first thing first, before we decide how we're going to enter a new market, we need to conduct very comprehensive market research to our own preparation. And then after that, we will start the negotiation stage with a potential partner or investor in the new markets. So during that stage, while we are doing the negotiation, we will start either ourselves or with a new partner to conduct the feasibility analysis because at this stage, there are lots of local knowledge. We won't understand from our own level, but we need a local partner to provide us insights. So usually I consider this as part of the negotiation stage to do the market exploration. And then after that, after we reach the agreement with a potential partner, we need to plan for the exit strategies from day one before we even set up the strategic alliance exposures or joint venture or different other another partnership structure in the new market or exposure in the new market as well. 
So we go to the case study part. The first thing I wanted to mention, which everybody knows about Apple. Apple is a very successful case in doing the expansion in the Asian market. And indeed, the Chinese market is consistently becoming one of the largest uh, market for Apple in terms of both revenue and brand reputation. Indeed, right now, Apple's revenue in China coming towards roughly about 20% of its total revenue, which can be found on their annual, on their annual 10K. Apple's expansion into China, Asia has been a, a significant part of its overall global strategy and contributing to substantial of its revenue. Apple's approach to entering the Chinese market is a hybrid of different structures, including partnerships, supply chain localization, and tailored product offerings. For example, Apple has adapted its product offering to meet the unique needs and preference of the Chinese consumer. The company has introduced the dual SIM capabilities in iPhone specifically for the Chinese consumer as dual SIM usage is more common in China as compared to other regions. Apple also focused on integrating local services and applications such as WeChat, one of China's leading messaging and payment platform to cater to the local markets digital ecosystem. Besides that, Apple ha also had a very strong retail presence and brand building. It has invested heavily in establishing a strong retail presence in China and other parts of Asia. The company opened its first store <coughs> in China in 2008 and has expanded to over 40 stores to now across major cities. So it used a hybrid strategy to open stores in China and like in the US, in the US, most of Apple stores are directly owned by the company. In China, Apple tried a very smart way to manage its risk. It has its own Apple store. It also author has its authorized retailers in China to sell or redistribute their products to lower operating cost. And unlike in the US, if we are using an iPhone and need to do some you know, like maintenance and the replacement of the batteries and all the screen will go to the Apple store directly and they will take care of that. In China, they licensed out the after sale services to another listed company in China, which again, further lowered their operational cost and risk in the Chinese market. So they did very lean. They managed the business model very lean in China almost like a new startup. They also localize the supply chain to do assembly in China to lower the manufacturing cost and supply chain cost. So the results is the achieved 20% of its total revenue at various points. So let's take a look at Tesla. Tesla's expansion to China has been a critical component of its global growth strategy. The first thing first, unlike Apple, Tesla built its magic factory in Shanghai a few years ago. And that factory in Shanghai indeed become the supply chain and the manufacturer production center for its global demand. Due to it has very strong manufacturing cost, usually since it's an electric vehicle market. And Elon Musk recognized China is the largest electric vehicle market in the world they decided to strategically enter the Chinese market to capitalize the growing demand for EVs in the market. And the results is very obvious. It's a successful story. In 2019, it became the first foreign automaker to wholly own a manufacturing plant in China. And one more interesting story to mention about Tesla is usually for foreign brands like Tesla, they are not allowed for the government people in China to use their vehicle. But since its plant is 100% built in China, they argued to be a made in China product to sell in those government related entities. 
And then another very successful story is Starbucks expansion into the APEC market. Starbucks indeed has been one of the most successful Western brands to expand into the Eastern market. Since opening its first store in Tokyo in 1996, it has rapidly expanded its brands presence across the region and becoming a dominant player in the coffee retail market. Starbucks first entered the Chinese market in 1999 through a joint venture with a local partner. And then in 2017, since it managed to grow very successfully and uh, they hire a very localized team to manage the market and regular, uh, deal with the regulators relationship, Starbucks decided to acquire the remaining 50% from the local partner to, to become the wholly owned subsidiary under its headquarters. It also has a very localized strategy towards their products and store experiments. For example, Starbucks has adapted its product offering to cater to local taste across the different countries in the APAC region. In China, for example, Starbucks introduced products such as green tea flavored beverage and moon cakes during the mid-autumn festival to adapt to the customer traditions here. The company also tailored its store designs and customer experience to reply local cultures. For example, stores in China featuring traditional Chinese elements, creating a unique blend of Western and Eastern aesthetics. Starbucks is also very adapted to the digital delivery in China and the rest of Asia. For example, it launched the Starbucks Delivers, a delivery service that leveraged Alibaba's extensive logistic net network in China to deliver their beverages and other food offerings to their customers who order their coffee online through their application. So let's take a look at the cultural considerations and impact on business. When engaging in cross-border investment, cultural considerations usually play a very crucial role in determining the success of the venture. For example, communication styles, direct versus indirect communications. Some cultures like the US prefer direct and straightforward communications and in Ger Germany, it's a similar style. Well, like in some Eastern countries like Japan and China may use a more indirect methods where complex and non-verbal views play a significant role. Understanding and adapt to this difference can prevent misinterpretations and misunderstanding. And language barrier is also critical because due to the language difference can lead to miscommunication if not properly managed. For example, many people in China and Japan, they can speak English fluently, but their understanding and the way they're expressing in English is different from most of the native English speakers in the US and in the UK. Negotiation tactics are also critical. Negotiation styles differ widely across different cultures. For example, American negotiators may favor quick and decisive deals to not wasting time, while Chinese negotiators might prefer building relationships and taking time to explore personalities and uh, all aspects of the business before reaching an agreement. Importance of relationships, such as in many Asian mid Middle East cultures, building trust and long-term relationships is often more important than the immediate details of the business deal, which is in the opposite way with Western cultures, where in most of the Western countries, we focus on more like contractual terms and decisive decisions. Thus, we go to the decision-making process due to the cultural difference. We will have the individualism versus collectivism. Well, this also is going to be related to your corporate governance structure as well rather than just the cultural difference, which I'm not going to spend too much time here, and the legal and ethical standard, which are critical for us to understand because for the legal part, the different legal norms based on different legal systems and practice are quite common in one country 
for example, something might be legal in one country, but will be illegal in another country. So we need to understand the local laws, including those related to corruption, labor, intellectual property are essential for us to protect our business. Ethical expectations are something a little bit weak to navigate, but will be very critical for us to consider. In some countries, gift giving is common practice in business, while in others, it might be seen as bribery. Ensuring compliance with local custom and international ethical standards is going to be important for international business. We'll skip the remaining part and go to the next page, building cross-cultural teams and leadership. So the first thing is very important to mention is the cultural awareness and sensitivity. Cultural training usually provide team members and leaders to increase awareness of cultural differences and sensitivities. This will bring us a preparation for communi different communication styles, business etiquette, decision making process, and social norms in different cultures. And transparency and effective communication. In different cultures, in monitoring different cultures, clear and open communication is e extremely important. Establishing a transparency and clear communication channels are usually going to decide how far you, are, you can go in your business. Recognizing that communication styles vary across cultures. Some cultures may prefer direct communications while others may use indirect methods. So based on that, we can try to come to a consensus and build common language and apply and use the common language to communicate across different cultures to reach our goals and to more effectively manage the negotiation. And we will usually invest in relationship building in the cross-border investments and leverage the tools and systems that could be used uh, across different countries to not have bans globally to ensure the communication channels are smooth and always have a conflict resolution system as part of the corporate governance structure. So what will be my practical team for managing cross-border negotiations? The first thing first, I'll suggest you to do your research before adapting to different communication styles and then prepare for different negotiation styles and manage your expectations. We will also need to consider the impact of legal and ethical standards in the local culture before we reach any decisions because sometimes what we understand is not what they are trying to express. And then their decisions and their words might be based on their previous experience and culture, the context you grew up, rather than if this is something good or bad. So we need to be flexible and use local experts and intermediaries to help us get this process. We also need to manage expectations to set realistic goals to be culturally appropriate for the negotiation process, as well as we need to prepare for different outcomes, including the need for multiple negotiation rounds or adjustment to propose another deal structure. And above all, we will have to be flexible and focus on mutual benefits to create a win-win situation and emphasize the win-win outcomes, highlight the mutual benefits of the proposed deal and focus on the long-term partnerships and creating value for both sides rather than just the short-term gains. Since we only have 15 minutes left, I'll go to the next section directly. So let's discuss as identifying the key risks. I separated, I segmented the key risk in three different categories. The first thing is going to be the political risk. The second part is going to be economic and financial related risk. And the third part is going to be operational risk. Political risk and governance include governance, governance stability, corruption levels, and the rule of the law, as well as the regulatory environment, geopolitical risk, 
and uh, how are we going to identify economic risk first? We need to take a look at the macroeconomic indicators, currency and exchange rate risk, as well as credit and interest rate risk. We need to consider how we are going to repatriate our profits back to our local markets and potential restrictions on capital inflows and outflows. And then come up and develop a rapid re repatriation strategy based on that and the tax structure based on our global government structure to do the tax optimization. Uh, in terms of the operational risk, we first need to assess the reliability and resilience of the local supply chain, including the availability of raw materials, components, and logistics support. Then we will have to evaluate the infrastructure quality and the supplier dependence. If we are very dependent on certain suppliers, we will need to prepare a few different key suppliers or logistic providers to avoid possible disruptions on certain supplier. Other risks include reputational risk, which we have to assess at the very beginning to make sure the brand uh, perception assess how our brand is perceived in the target market before we even enter that, including potential risk related to the cultural missteps or ethical controversies. And then we need to manage the media and public opinions to monitor the local media and public opinion to identify potential reputational risk, such as negative publicity or social activity. And then we have to do a proactive reputation management strategy and engage in proactive reputation management by communicating our company's values, ethics, and communicate commitment to the local community. So how are we going to develop a risk mitigation strategies? For example, in terms of political risk, we will need to consider things like political risk insurance, and diversify investment across multiple countries or regions to reduce exposures to political risk in any single market. This approach helps us spread the risk and minimizes impact of ad adverse political events in one location. We also need to do significant government relations in certain markets and build strong relationship with local governments and regulators and engage in regular dialogue with the policymakers. Local partnership, of course, is going to be critical. Partner with local business or form joint ventures to navigate the political landscape more effectively. And then let's take a look at this graph over here. So I wanted you to take a look at the data over here. So uh, this is based on the average data from the past three years. For US companies entering new international markets globally, there are more than 45% of the US U.S. companies decide to use either a joint venture or strategic alliance rather than other ways to enter the new market, which is quite significant. And uh, it's one of the top go-to choice for U.S. companies. And similar to the U.S. companies, for European companies entering the new market, the, the data is even higher. Roughly about more than 50% of the European companies in total across all different sectors using strategic alliance or joint ventures in entering new market. And this data is even more significant for technology and pharma industries, where 50, more than 55% companies in the technology and pharma industries from Europe are, are deciding to use a strategic alliance or joint venture in entering new market rather than other methods. So what's the importance of local partnership and strategic alliance? So things like access to local market knowledge, simplified, market entry and expansion and mitigation on political and cultural risk and cost efficiency so that we can leverage the specific data, resources, regulation, uh, regulator access, as well as the distribution channels from the existing partner to enter the ma market faster. We will have a localized team there to manage the potential risk and get us through the process as well. So what will be the importance of transparency and accountability? First, it gives us the opportunity to build trust with stakeholders 
ensuring compliance with local and international regulations, mitigating financial and operator, uh, operational risk, and facilitating better and effective decision making. I'll skip this slide to go to the next section. So what will be the benefits of joint ventures and strategic alliance? So for joint ventures, since we have a local partner joined our business entity in the new market, we'll have the shared risk and resources to share with both parties. And then it's a more formalized structure as well. A joint venture is a separate legal entity with a clear organizational structure so that we can apply a very clear and manage the corporate governance structure into the new business entity. This could provide clarity in roles, responsibilities, and governance. This structure often leads to a more stable and long-term commitments from both parties and give us local market penetration and enhance the control and alignment. Joint ventures are typically formed with a long-term perspective rather than a short-term perspective, focusing on more sustained collaboration and growth. And these long-term focus can lead to deeper integration and more substantial market impact over time. So what will be the benefits of the strategic alliance? I mean, strategic alliance is quite similar to joint venture and sometimes joint venture is part of strategic alliance. But if it's, you're, you're building a strategic lines without active participation, it gives us flexibility rather than joint ventures. In addition, it has lower commitment and cost as compared to a joint venture, which both shareholders needs to invest significantly to the new entity and gives us a faster speed in entering the new markets. It also gives us risk mitigation similar to the joint venture, and it gives us a flexibility to focus on our core competencies. This could lead to potentially more effective and efficient corporations, especially in areas like supply chain management or technology development. What will be the key elements of a successful joint venture? So first thing first I want to mention is going to be identifying and engaging the right partner, which is quite critical because the success of joint venture largely depends on choosing the right partner. The right partner should bring complementary strengths, market knowledge, technology expertise, or resources. Additionally, the right partner should have a compatible corporate culture and share strategic goals with us rather than they are just having the enough resources for us which could potentially lead to conflicts, inefficiencies, and eventually a failure of the joint venture. After that, after we have the right partner, we need to choose the most feasible partnership structure. Either it's going to be a licensing structure or a strategic alliance or more deep like a joint venture structure. It's going to be based on our overall market feasibility and we will figure out the right structure to go. And then we'll set localized strategic ob objectives based on comprehensive market feasibility analysis and robust legal and governance framework. There are some interesting data for us to observe as part of the key elements of the successful joint ventures. So usually, let's take a look at the right-hand side. So usually people will think of 50-50 joint venture or lines are more likely to fail, which from data is indeed of the way. From the existing data, we figure out even for some large corporations, 50-50 joint ventures and structures are more likely to succeed. As we can see from this graph over here, we have 60% of the 50-50 structure become successful on only 31% on the split uh, and even structure become successful. This is an interesting data for us to keep in mind. It's not a conclusion, but something to explore. And in mergers and acquisitions, sometimes if the two players are having some overlaps globally, it gives more chances for the acquirer to become a failure. But in terms of the strategic alliance, minimal geographic overlap will bring more chances of success. So this varies by structure. 
So we need to think about whether we are doing uh, inlands or mergers and acquisitions in a local market or global market. Negotiating terms and lining objects. We, I will skip this slide and go to the key studies directly. Since we spoke about Starbucks, so Starbucks also did a joint venture in India to leverage in a local Indian company Tata Global Beverage Resources here. And I want to uh, speak a little bit more on Ford. Ford's joint venture with Chang'an Automobile Group in China. It was a joint venture structure as well. And uh, commercial lines is considered as a very successful joint venture. But in terms of the joint venture become highly successful from the commercial perspective with Ford achieving significant market share in China. In 2013, Chang'an Ford, which is the name of the joint bunch, was producing over 600,000 vehicles annually, contributing to the global expansion revenue growth. Seems like a very successful joint venture from the revenue perspective, but it's not a very successful joint venture from the brand management success, uh, perspective. Indeed, Chang'an's brand it's a large manufacturing company in China, but it's not a very highly reputed brand in terms of, you know, uh, like for family use the cars and mid and high end cars. It is usually conceptual as low end cars. Thus, this brings some brand damage to Ford in China, which most people didn't really know. And when people are starting to shop or upgrade their cars, they will skip Chang'an Ford and go to another brand. So. That was something interesting for us to consider when we're doing the market feasibility analysis. That's the importance of bringing up a local partner, a trusted partner in China to do the market feasibility for us and become the operating partner for us before we e even decide to do the huge investment with another Chinese partner or a partner in other countries as well. BP. British Petroleum is also a joint venture structure and a strategic alliance with Reliance Industries Limited in entering the new market. Uh, and like the other key study we just mentioned for General Mills and uh, Nestle, they enter into both a strategic alliance and joint venture in developing the global markets rather than a certain local market. Since we only have three minutes left, I'll skip the details and open for questions any audiences may have. And uh, before we go to this stage, I just want to give a very quick summarization of what we covered today. So the main points in cross-border investment is it's not something we can cover the full picture in this one hour webinar. And if we want to use one minute to summarize, the first thing is going to be a strategic planning process, which we have to do our own research and work with our local partner to come up with the very comprehensive market feasibility and due diligence. And then we go to the local partnerships to build strong local partnerships with the right local partner to navigate us through the process and bring invaluable assets in market trends and regulatory landscapes. And then after we form the structure with the local partner, we go to the corporate governance structure and launch the project and process management, risk management strategies based on the right corporate governance structure to sustain our ongoing success in the international markets. So that's the end of our webinar today. I want to go back to Lady and uh, to see if any questions our audiences may have. Um, okay, um, thank you so much um, to you, Sebright, for that insightful presentation. Now it's time for your question. Please type them into the Q&A tab or at the chat box, and I'll select a few for Mr. Sebright to address it live. So I saw uh, yes. many, many audiences were saying that, can we have the slide deck? I mean, that's something I need to work with Lady to see if the trick council is okay to share with the slides. Yes, actually, um, 
it's okay. Uh, we wanted to ask your permission as well if we can share this one since we also asked for your presentation or your PowerPoint presentation, correct? Right. Uh, so I will have my team share a shareable version to you so that you can share with the audiences. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a question here from Mr. Jonathan Poppy. So the question is, what specific hurdles are there on the regulatory side as we do filings in the U.S.? Well, that's a very, well, that's a very good question. I mean, I mean, John, thanks for that. But, you know, one thing is we, we need to figure out which sector what you're referring to, right? Because each sector has very specific, you know, requirements. The safest law is always a, a one thing to go for foreign enterprises into the U.S. market. But, uh, if we're speaking about biotech industries, the regulation are going to be different from the technology industries in broad and telecommunication industry is going to be different as well. And manufacturing usually is much easier, but for financial services, we have to consider all the regulations from ICC and things like that as well. So it really is a case by case situation. Uh, I mean, I'll be happy to chat with you more afterwards if you would like to reach out to me. Either, you know, maybe Lady can share my email with you or something like that. We can chat more. Of course, um, I can definitely help you with that. Yeah. So let me check. Okay, I also saw a question here from Alok Dubai. So are there any specific and different approach for a contract manufacturing segment? So in terms of contract manufacturing, um, well, first, uh, which country were you referring to, right? Um, so if you are referring to countries like China, uh, it's, it's a more, more matured market as compared to certain countries in Southeast Asia. All, uh, you know, like certain countries in Africa, because um, you know many international corporations have formed the contract manufacturing um, agreement with the local partners already. So you know, for example, uh, I, I don't know which industry you are. Again, you know, so I just give you a random example. So if you are a biotech company, a medical device company, and trying to hire. A manufacturing company here. Usually there are CDMO companies here. You can hire. It's not just in China, but global companies as well. But uh, you have to be very careful in selecting those companies because some of this, the manufacturing partners, if they are not reputable enough, they can just uh, take your intellectual properties and copy your device and make another local version. So uh, I saw you start uh, manufacturing engineering. Is that hardware? Or Oh, you know, like uh, what, what type of products were you referring to? Thank you so much for that. So let me double check. Okay, so I think we were already done with this. I also have a closing announcement here before we end this uh, webinar. So before we conclude, I have a few important announcements like um, today's session has been recorded and will be available on the ITC YouTube channel. Please feel free to revisit the content or share it with your network. So if there is anyone who wanted to um, watch the replay, we will uploading this um, video or this live session to the uh, to the ITC YouTube channel. And for those who aren't yet uh, an ITC members, Attending today's webinar qualifies you for a free membership, so don't miss this opportunity to join um, to our community. And last one, all of the participants of this webinar will receive a certificate of participation. Keep an eye on your email over the next few days for more details. So, Mr. Sivray, do you have any final thoughts that you would like to share about today's presentation? Sure. I mean, it's... It's cross-border investment is always a very sophisticated topic to discuss. And uh, one hour is not enough for us at all to you know, dive into the details of every segment.
toward that. And thanks everyone for the time tonight and today for certain countries and tonight for certain countries as well. I really appreciate that. And um, uh, if any of you have more detailed questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy to discuss further with you. And uh, in terms of slide deck, I'll ask my team to share Lady like a brief version so that uh, each of you can get a copy. And, uh, you know, I look forward to discuss further details with you and uh, especially under the current context globally. And thanks again for joining me. Thank you so much for that, Sabrai. So um, also if any attendees or are, since all of our attendees here, I would like to contact you, I guess, for your presentation. Could you please share your email address in the chat a chat box for them sure. to contact you directly? Okay, perfect. Okay. So I just to share my email address is a very simple is seabright.chen at summeratlantic.com. Okay, perfect. So I wanted to remind everyone that um, the email address of Mr. Seabright are already posted here as well, or um, it's already on the screen right now. And for everyone that I was here, it's already on the chat box. I will share my email address as well for um, those anyone who are not yet a member of the ITC, you can contact me directly or leave a message to my email address. So again, um, thank you everyone. So as we wrap up for today's session, and I encourage everyone to apply the key insights um, that we've discussed to your own companies or industries. Focus on strategic cross-border investments to unlock new growth opportunities and or ensure strong regulatory and cultural navigation and enhance your risk management practices. Consider um, leveraging joint ventures to expand your market presence. Also remember the real value comes from implementing these strategies in your day-to-day -day operations and long-time plans. So before we go, please note that also that again, the webinar is available on the ITC YouTube channel and for all of the participants, will receive a certificate of participation via email on the upcoming day. So we appreciate again your active participation and we're here to support you as you put this insight into action. Thank you and we look forward to seeing you at the future webinars. Thank you so much, Mr. Sebright. Have a good one day. Thank you, lady. Thanks, Al. Thanks. All right, bye. Thank you, bye.